Thank you, Senators. Senators, I have received through the Governor General from the Governor of South Australia the certificate of the choice by the South Australian Parliament of Andrew Lockhart McLaughlin, CSC, to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Corey Bernardi, and I table the document. A new senator approaches the chamber. Admit the senator. Will the honourable senator please come to the table to make and subscribe the oath of allegiance? On the card handed to you. I, Andrew McLaughlin, do swear that I will be faithful and bear a true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. Senator, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Thank you, Senators. If I could ask everyone to resume their seats. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senator Revised Ministry List. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that the updated Ministry List reflects the updated Ministry announced by the Prime Minister on uh, 6 February 2020. Updated representing arrangements are outlined in the Ministry List. Thank you, Senator. Foreman. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise that the opposition has made adjustments to arrangements for representation in the Senate of shadow ministers who are members of the House of Representatives. Uh, I seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Hansard and advise the Senate that, like Senator Cormann, there are no National Party members on our, on our list. Leave is 
I take it that leave is granted. We shall now move to questions without notice. Senator McAllister. Liberals are doing water. Order. Thanks, Mr wow. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In September, Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management and now Deputy Leader of the National Party, David Littleproud, said, and I quote, I don't know if climate change is man-made. Does the Deputy Leader of the National Party's statement reflect the government's position? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The government's position is uh, well known and well understood. Uh, we are committed to effective action on climate change and we are committed to a policy agenda which is environmentally effective and economically uh, responsible. And that is, of course, what we have been pursuing very successfully over the last uh, six and a half years in government. Indeed. Uh, our commitments to uh, emission, internationally agreed emissions reduction targets uh, has been consistent has been consistent all the way through through the Abbott government the Turnbull government and indeed now the Morrison government and indeed if you order look at senator Cormann, senator McAllister on a point of order uh, mr president I, does this go to relevance the question is whether or not the government accepts that climate change is man made um, that was part of the question senator McAllister I think with respect senator Cormann is being directly relevant to the question asked Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Just to again confirm the government's position. The government's position uh, is that we are committed to effective action on climate change. And if you, if you consider uh, our performance in, uh, uh, against the 2020 uh, emissions reduction target agreed to in Kyoto, uh, we, are, we are beating that target. Only one of a handful of countries that is beating uh, their Kyoto emissions reduction target. And indeed, we are on track to meet our 2030. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. President, and I, I listened to your ruling earlier, and I, I, uh, the opposition is, uh, would like some clarification of what are the other aspects of the question to which you believe uh, the minister is being relevant. The, the, the only quote is a quote, so there's a reference to the deputy leader, and there is a quote, and there's a question about whether that statement reflects the government's yeah. position. So uh, I, I, I would yeah, ask, sure. I would ask the, the president to indicate what, what are the other aspects of the, I'm entitled to do this. Thank you. Ask the President to... Order. Can I hear the point of order? <laughs> Thank you. I, I would ask you, Mr President, to advise the Chamber as to what are the other aspects of the statement to which you believe the Minister is relevant. Okay. Um, Senator Cormann on the point of order. Much, uh, Mr President, on uh, the point of order, I was asked a question about the position of the government uh, in relation to climate change, and I'm answering, I'm answering, that in a, I'm answering it in a manner that is directly relevant. Um, um, I'm, I'm, on, on the point of order, Quite right, Senator, Senator Wong. You had a quote there from a minister at the time and then a question um, that related to the quote. And, and with respect, I think the minister is actually being directly relevant to the quote and the question in the subject matter he is dealing with. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but I think what he's saying is directly relevant to the quote and the question. I, 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 I'm happy to review the Hansard, and if I'm wrong, I'll say so. I'm happy to take submissions on it. But I, I, I think I'm being, people are seeking me to direct him how to answer a question which is outside my capacity. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As is uh, well understood, the government absolutely accepts that uh, climate change is a global problem that needs to be addressed in a globally coordinated fashion. And indeed, Australia, as part of the global community, is doing its bit uh, to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we're doing so in a way that is uh, environmentally effective and economically responsible. Indeed, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at uh, our commitment to 2030 on a per capita basis, that means a reduction in emissions by 50 per cent uh, on the basis of uh, uh, our emissions intensity, emissions per unit of GDP. We are committed to a reduction of two-thirds, uh, which is more ambitious than uh, the European Union, more ambitious than Canada, more ambitious than uh, New Zealand and many other countries. And, and of course, <laughs> And of course, I mean, what, what, what matters here is the policy position of the government. The policy position is very clear. We are committed to effective action on climate change, and we leave the theological arguments to the Labor Party and the Greens. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Order. Uh, I can't hear Senator McAllister. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, when asked about the cause of climate change on ABC's Q and A last Monday, Senator Molan said, and I quote. As to whether it is human-induced climate change, my mind is open. Does Senator Molan's statement reflect the government's position? 
Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I'm asked about Senator Moore. Let me say what a fine senator for the great state of New South Wales. And what an outstanding job Senator Moore did uh, in the context of the bushfires, working up and down the coast of New South Wales, supporting bushfire affected communities in New South Wales. Fine senator indeed. And of course, uh, Senator Moore, like any individual senator in this place, is of course entitled to his opinions. But as far as the government is concerned, the government's position is very clear. We are committed to effective action on climate change as part of a globally coordinated effort. Our targets... Order. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Uh, my point of order again goes to relevance. Uh, Senator Cormann has been asked to provide advice as to whether Senator Mullen's uh, position reflects the government position. And Senator Mullen's position specifically goes to whether or not climate change is human-induced. And I'm asking Senator Cormann to answer that question. Um, on the point of order, or continue. On the point of order, um, I appreciate that very well put point of order, Senator McAllister. But I think it goes to the point of instructing a minister, me asking me to instruct a minister how to answer a question. Um, people are entitled to judge ministers' answers of questions as long as they are directly relevant. They are within standing orders. I do believe that the material the minister is addressing is directly relevant to the question, um, and I call him to continue. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Let me say it again very slowly. Uh, our government is committed to effective action on climate change. And, 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 we are doing so, and we are doing so in a way that is environmentally effective and economically responsible, and we're doing Order. it as part of the global community. Order. On my and left. Indeed, and I indeed, can't. And Order on my left, Senator Cormann, please resume your seat. If I can't hear Senator Cormann's quite loud voice, then there is way too much noise in the chamber. Senator Cormann to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We are part of the uh, global community of nations which are committed, which is committed to effective action on climate Order, change. Senator we are Cormann, doing our time bit. for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Once more, does the Morrison government accept that climate change is human-induced? Senator Cormann. Uh, yes. <laughs> Senator Dean Smith. Thank you. Order. Thank you. Order. Sorry, Senator Smith, I'm going to ask you. Oh. It is put to me often that question time is a forum for the opposition. Um, time is being wasted by virtue of the interjections. I need silence before I call Senator Smith. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. With the visit today of President Joko Widodo, can the minister update the Senate on the importance of Australia's relationship with Indonesia? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. It's been a great pleasure and a delight today to welcome uh, back uh, President Widodo to a guest of government visit to Australia, his fourth since 2014, and also privileged to have him address both houses of the parliament uh, this morning. I was also very pleased to welcome my good friend uh, Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi and many of their cabinet colleagues uh, to Canberra today. Of course, Indonesia is a nation of absolutely first-order importance uh, to Australia. It's a dynamic, democratic, diverse nation, a G20 member and the world's largest Muslim nation. It's already a trillion-dollar economy and is predicted to become one of the world's largest economies in coming decades. We are both strong regional democracies, with a shared vision for a prosperous and open Indo-Pacific underpinned by strong institutions, rule of law and norms. Most importantly, Indonesia is our neighbour and our friend. In fact, as President Widodo reinforced in his remarks this morning, we are neighbours by destiny, but we are friends by choice. More recently, we have become comprehensive strategic partners. We also stand beside each other in adversity, as both the Prime Minister and the President observed in their remarks in the House of Representatives today. I would also like to acknowledge the 40 members from the Indonesian National Armed Forces who are helping with Australia's bushfire recovery, and most particularly in the Blue Mountains in my area of Western Sydney. Mr. President, we also look forward to the ratification and entry into force of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. The IACEPA, as it is known, will improve trade, tourism, investment and the movement of people will facilitate bilateral cooperation in areas including education, agriculture, health and digital commerce. It paves the way for the strongest possible development of the Australia-Indonesia relationship. 
Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on what the government is doing to further build on Australia's close relationship with its neighbour and friend, Indonesia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his supplementary question. I was delighted also this morning to join with Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi to sign the plan of action for our comprehensive strategic partnership with Indonesia in the presence of President Widodo and Prime Minister Morrison. The plan sets out our shared commitments across trade and investment, defence, counter-terrorism and people smuggling, maritime security, education and partnering in regional and international fora. It provides practical and measurable steps to build on our existing cooperation. The plan outlines well over 100 initiatives our governments are pursuing together in this new chapter in our relationship, including new measures on aviation security, on peacekeeping operations, on cyber, on disaster response management, on health security threats and tackling marine plastics. It is these and other initiatives under the uh, CSP which will ensure that our relationship with Indonesia remains healthy, vital and most definitely growing. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise what steps the government is taking to build understanding and cooperation with Indonesia? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and again thank you to Senator Smith for his question. Uh, we are working very hard between us to grow the understanding between our people and our communities. More than 1.3 million Australians visit Indonesia every year, a record number, and a growing number of Indonesian tourists are coming to Australia. But our education links are particularly strong. Australia hosts around 20,000 Indonesian students annually, and we're very pleased to provide Australia Award scholarships to talented young Indonesians to study in Australia. Australia, rem Australia remains the top destination for Indonesian students studying abroad, and it's also, Indonesia in turn is also by far the most popular overseas destination for our new Colombo Plan program. In fact, since 2014, over 9,500 young Australians have studied, lived and experienced life in Indonesia. They are most certainly voting with their feet. And it's perfectly demonstrated by Monash University's announcement today that it will open a new campus in Indonesia in the coming year. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Cole Beck. I refer to a media release by the Prime Minister dated 30 March 2019, which announced both the final round of funding for the government's corrupt sports rort scheme, together with an additional $150 million to support female facilities. The Prime Minister's media release states, and I quote, further details of the change room and swimming facilities fund will be released later in 2019. Minister, when were these further details released and to whom? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, can I, uh, again, as many of us have done here in the chamber over the last week, completely reject the characterisation of the Labor Party of the uh, CSIG program? Because it was a very, very good and, and, quite frankly, Mr. President, a very, very popular program. In fact, Mr. President, the uh, the program was so popular. Uh, that Labor, Par Labor Party members of parliament uh, wrote letters of endorsement for projects in their oh. electorates seeking uh, for their projects to be funded, Mr. President. So, um, Mr. President, this was a very, very popular program. I completely and utterly reject the characterisation that's being made by the Labor Party. A very popular program. And Mr. Pro Mr. President, so popular that not one member of the opposition has offered to get some of the money back for the projects that were uh, announced in their project, uh, where the uh, intervention of Senator Mackenzie in her decision-making process increased the proportion of grants in Labor electorates from 26 per cent to 34 per cent, which much more closely aligns it with the number of Labor seats in the parliament, Mr President. So, uh, Mr President, I reject completely uh, the characterisation of this program that consistently well, is put Senator, by the Labor Senator Party. Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance, Mr President. I'm conscious of previous rulings. He's, uh, the minister has now had over a minute. There was one question related to the release of guidelines uh, as per the Prime Minister's commitment, uh, and I'd ask him to return to the question. Um, on the point of order, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate uh, that question at the end, and I realise that. Um, I, and, um, 
you are, you are entitled to do that. Um, the minister has been speaking for over a minute. He is addressing part of the question, as we found out in the last question. Spe very specific questions can get very specific answers, but the minister is entitled to challenge assertions made in a preamble to a question, but you've emphasised that part of the question. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you for your ruling. Uh, Mr President, um, the, uh, as I've said, and I, and I will repeat, uh, the CSIG program was a very popular, very very popular program, supported by members of parliament across the, uh, across both sides of the parliament. Uh, in fact, advocated for by members uh, on both sides, advocated for members on both sides. A point of order, Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the uh, minister is simply uh, addressing the preamble. There was a specific question, and it said. When were the details of these projects released and to whom? Could you um, please? I, I, I cannot direct a minister to answer part of a question. A minister is entitled to address uh, an assertion, a contestable assertion made in the preamble. It is up to others to judge the merits of answers of questions, not up to the chair. So the minister is entitled to continue by addressing all or part of a question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and, and I will continue to assert that this very good and popular program, supported by members across all sides of the parliament, Mr. President, all sides across all sides of the parliament, advocated for by members on the other side who sought funding under the program, uh, and as I've said, and as the parliament order, Senator Cormann on the point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, understanding orders, interjections are disorderly, and the leader of the opposition constantly interjects, uh, even when uh, her entire side is silent. Uh, I think you should call the leader of the opposition to order. All interjections are disorderly at all times. I remind senators of that. Sorry. Sorry, Senator Cormann. So, so now uh, the Leader of the Opposition is even interjecting while you are addressing the Chamber. More, dis more um, latitude is granted to leaders, but um, I would ask all senators to remain silent. And I'll call Senator Colbeck to continue. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So, so th this, this popular program, supported by all members of the parliament, uh, Order, continues Senator to Colbeck. deliver for Australia Order on my left. the country. Senator, time's expired. On... Senator Wong. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. I do have one. Uh, has the minister received any advice from either Sport Australia or the Department of Health expressing concerns that no guidelines or further details were ever distributed despite the Prime Minister stating they would be. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, thanks uh, for the question, Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Sport Australia has no engagement in the FFWSS program, uh, so no need for uh, any uh, involvement at all. And Mr President, uh, the Department of Health is, is utilising the guidelines uh, for the uh, implementation, the delivery of the grants that uh, are being made through the FFWS program using the CDG guidelines uh, as our responsibility, the responsibility that I have under this program now, which is to deliver the grants that were subject of election promises, just like the Labor Party made election promises. I think $250 million worth of election promises during the election. Uh, and uh, so we are using uh, as uh, part of the delivery mechanism for this program, the CDG guidelines, which relate very closely to guidelines that are used for other delivery of other election commitments. Order. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Order on my left. Senator Farrell. Yeah, thank you, Mr President. I do have a further question. Uh, in light of the minister's answer, can the minister explain why $150 million of taxpayers' money was allocated without any guidelines? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Farrell, for the question. Quite simply, Mr. President, uh, just as the Labor Party did uh, when they made $250 million worth of election commitments for sporting projects, uh, the, uh, the government uh, has made a number of election commitments uh, and is, is delivering those election commitments through this program. It's quite simple, order, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck. We Senator, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. I'll take the point of order. Senator Colbeck. The point of oh, order. Sorry, Senator Wong. Thank you. Direct relevance. This relates to an announcement prior to the election. The only question 
that is being asked is why $150 million of taxpayers' money is allocated without guidelines. I'd ask the minister to return to the question. Um, I, I was listening very carefully. Uh, unless I, I'm quite happy to be corrected if I misheard. I thought the minister was turning to that very point at, at that time, and I'll ask him to continue, but I am listening because it was a specific question. Listening carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, thank you for your ruling. Mr President, as I said, uh, the government made a number of election commitments in the, in the lead up to the election, in the same way that the Labor Party made a number of uh, election commitments. In fact, the Labor Party made uh, order, more election order. commitments than we did. The Labor Party made $250 million worth of election promises for sporting facilities and women's change rooms. We made a smaller amount, uh, Mr. President, and uh, this program is being utilised to deliver on those election commitments. Uh, just like we are. The Labor Party would have to have devised a program to deliver on their election commitments. Both sides of politics make, make election commitments. Mr. Order, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck. Both time for the answer has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister to, for Trade, Tourism, Order. Investment. Sorry, I, I need to be able to hear Senator Patterson's question. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism, and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline the mutual benefits for farmers, businesses, investors and workers when the trade agreement with Indonesia comes into force? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson for his question and his passionate advocacy for increasing trade access for Australian businesses and liberalising trade across the globe. Mr President, a central pillar of Australia's deepening relationship with Indonesia is the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, and we were thrilled that uh, late last week, just prior to President Widodo's visit to Australia, the Indonesian parliament did uh, what the Australian parliament did late last year uh, and provided support for that agreement, which will enable its ratification and entry into force over the coming months. Uh, this is an outstanding opportunity to finally and fully realise the potential of the economic relationship between Australia and Indonesia. As the Australia-Indonesia Business Council President Phil Turtle said recently, IACEPA has been designed to deliver balanced outcomes for both countries and puts emphasis on cooperative initiatives. And we want to work with Indonesia to build its economy and its skill base by supporting investment and genuine partnerships across sectors like education, meat, grains and elsewhere. Because, Mr President, as Senator Payne has indicated already, a successful and stable Indonesia is central for and good for Australia and our region, as well as, of course, for Indonesia. There are multiple benefits from IACEPA uh, across a range of sectors, including in the services industries, mining services, health, hospital and aged care, education, I've already mentioned, architecture and engineering. There are enhanced opportunities into the Australian market for uh, areas of ambition of Indonesia, such as the electric vehicle market, uh, as well as opportunities in terms of enhanced work rights around working holiday makers who make such a valuable contribution to our economy. Uh, our agricultural, our steel making and other sectors all gain significantly, whether it's 575,000 access uh, for cattle, 500,000 tonnes of grain, uh, around 455 semi-loads of oranges, Order, Senator a Senator range Birmingham. of different categories. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what else the government is doing to build a more resilient economy and create opportunities in new markets? For our exporters, tourism operators, and international education providers to sustain jobs. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, our government has always recognised that uh, the more Australian farmers and businesses are able to access choice and diversity across the globe, the better it is for them to build their resilience, uh, particularly in some of the challenging times that we face at present. Uh, that's why, as a government, we pursued aggressively trade opportunities with Japan, Korea, China, uh, the implementation of the Trans Pacific Partnership. And of course, in line with the passage of the Indonesia Agreement through this parliament, we welcomed the passage of the Hong Kong Free Trade Agreement, which entered into force last month on 17 January, which was acknowledged as being important uh, for insurance, banking and fintech sectors. 
The Peru Agreement, I'm pleased to inform the Senate, will come into force tomorrow, the 11th of February, uh, and that has been recognised as opening up a level playing field for Australian mining, engineering and technological services companies, excellent opportunities across other services industries, including also in goods, uh, wine, sheep meat, kangaroo meat and other sectors will all benefit from that diversification. Order. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate of other recent good news on the trade front? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, six years of creating new market access opportunities is delivering for Australia. ABS data last week showed Australia posted our largest ever calendar year trade surplus in 2019. That was a trade surplus of $67.6 billion, fuelled, Mr President, by a record-breaking run of 24 consecutive monthly trade surpluses from Australia. You have to go back, Mr President, to 1972-73 to find the previous record. Uh, and indeed, it's fuelled in part uh, by exports of goods surging up 13.4% in 2019 over 2018 levels, resources up, manufacturing exports up, rural exports uh, also up, uh, notwithstanding drought conditions. Yearly services exports also growing by 8.9%, recognising the diversification of our economy and crossing the $100 billion mark for our services exports for the first time ever as we help to charge all aspects Order. of the Australian Senator economy. Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. After 10 years of the Greens campaigning for a federal corruption watchdog, the major parties finally agreed in 2018 that one was needed. Twelve months ago, the government said it was imminent. Since then, we've had a constant stream of scandals, but still no bill. Has the government delayed because the Prime Minister knew many of his ministers were involved in integrity scandals and that there were more to come? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, no. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Well, at least we got an answer that time. Thank you. Um, legal experts have said that even if it had been introduced, the weak design principles that your government proposed would mean that the body would not have been able to investigate any of those scandals that have embroiled your government's ministers. Why would you deliberately design a watchdog that was toothless? What are you scared it will find? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely reject uh, the premise of the question. Uh, there is nothing uh, in this question that I agree with. But of course, the Parliament, uh, including the Senate, will have the opportunity of uh, conducting a debate uh, about uh, the bill to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission in due course. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Well, the Senate, in fact, already did that. The Greens bill to establish an independent corruption watchdog passed the Senate five months ago, uh, and it would have applied to all of the ministerial scandals that are further eroding public trust. If you had any commitment to cleaning up politics, you would bring on that bill for a vote in the House, and we could have a federal corruption watchdog by Easter. Will you do so? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, no. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Ms Ray Harvey lost her home in the bushfires and has been living on her property with no running water, electricity or internet. She had applied for the disaster relief payment twice and had been rejected twice because she couldn't provide the bank account details for a government payment from 25 years ago. Why is the government burdening bushfire victims with bureaucracy? Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and I thank Senator Keneally for her question. Um, obviously, we have been through a particularly devastating time over recent months with the bushfires and the impact that it's had on the communities that have been absolutely devastated. Part of the response that uh, this government, the federal government, uh, an unprecedented response, I might add, um, for the kind of natural disaster that we have seen over recent months, um, part of it has been to make sure that we are quickly able to respond to people who are in need. Now, obviously, as the senator would be well aware, um, I'm not in a position to comment on individual cases. But as I have always said in this place, if there is ever a particular situation or an individual case where they would like the matter taken up, I'm more than happy to take that matter up, and I'm also more than happy to make sure that the minister responsible for these government services is uh, is also made aware Order. of it. 
order. However, this is not the forum in which we should be debating individual cases. However, I would say, uh, I would say that the response that we have seen to the devastating impacts of these bushfires by Services Australia through the Australian Government Disaster Re Re Recovery Fund. Um, has been unprecedented. We have seen hundreds of millions of dollars made available to people who are in need. In my own portfolio area, as an example, we made $50 million available for emergency relief so that we could get money immediately to people who may have needed some may have needed accommodation, may have needed to, to, uh, to uh, get um, clothing, to get food. So subsequent to this response, this, uh, the, the, the time of the response, the ability for the payments to be able to made uh, very quickly has been something that has been um, acknowledged by the broader community, the broader bushfire community. Of course there will always be situations where sometimes things aren't as perfect as we would like, and that is why we always come into this place and say, if you have a particular situation you would like us to deal with, we're more than happy to do so. But hundreds of thousands of Australians who have been impacted by the bushfires have received a timely response from this government. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. <laughs> Mayor of Bega, Christy McBain, raised concerns that it was difficult for bushfire victims to get help, saying that, and I quote, some people just want to get on and help themselves, and that becomes difficult when there's always a form to fill out, a process to go through, a number to ring, a meeting to attend. So I think that definitely adds to the frustration. Does the minister agree with the mayor's assessment? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. Thank, you. thank the senator for a follow-up question. Well, as the senator would understand, there is always a process that needs to go through before taxpayers' funds are made available to people. One of the things that we did as a government after these unprecedented bushfires was to make sure that we made that as easy as possible. But to come into this place and suggest that you don't have to go through any process at all, you can just turn up and ask for money, is, 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 is However, I would say that one of, one of the things that has— Order on my left. One of the things that has been of, of, we have received um, you know, a great amount of rec um, uh, commendation for is the fact that people who rang the number, the 180266 number, were having their calls answered on average under one minute and the people were not being, being made to wait. And sometimes people got off their phone and looked at their bank accounts and the money had already paid into their bank accounts. So I would say that the the system is obviously working when the majority of people are receiving their money the same Order, day. Senator Rustin. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. When questioned about the difficulty accessing payments, Minister Stuart Robert claimed Ooh. the speed at which we're operating now is unseen in a disaster in this country. Is boasting about the government's speedy response the best that Minister Robert can offer people like Ms Harvey and Mayor McBain? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, look, I, I think I probably referred in my answer to my previous question. The fact is that the responses and the, the responses have been very quick. People who have been ringing the number that I just gave have been getting immediate responses, and they are having the money paid into their bank accounts almost immediately. In fact, in most instances, within a matter of hours, somebody who has applied for the Australian government disaster recovery payment has received it. We also know that, in, uh, that we made the decision to increase the amount of money that was made available to children in the lead-up to going back to school. So instead of it being $1,000 for adults and $400 for children, an additional $400 was made available so that children returning to school at the end of January would be able to have the assistance to be able to buy the things that they needed. So, I'm quite happy to take the individual cases that you refer to and see if there has been a problem. But in general, I think you'll find that the majority of Australians impacted by these bushfires have been very happy and grateful for the response by this government. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Australia's table grape production will reach a record 240,000 tonnes this season, up 14 per cent from 2018 19 when grape exports increased 43 per cent to 580 million. The cause of increased production is Chinese demand outstripping supply. Yet China is now cancelling orders owing to the port closures due to the coronavirus. Our grape growers are harvesting this record crop right now. The Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement could have given our producers an opportunity to ex export some of this extra production to Indonesia. This is not happening, though, Indonesia re remains a challenging and unpredictable destination. In the main, this is because of Indonesian bureaucracy and intransigence. 
Will your office immediately advocate with Indonesia to implement the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership to open Indonesia to Australian table grapes? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. Uh, let me deal with a couple of uh, the matters that Senator Roberts has raised. He is, uh, he is correct that as uh, market opportunities, business opportunities for Australian farmers, other businesses have opened up as a result of trade agreements struck by Australia. Farmers and businesses have adapted uh, their businesses to take advantage of those opportunities. They've planted more of certain varieties. They've grown more of, uh, of certain commodities, uh, and that, of course, is as you would expect. That is one of the reasons why. Australia has just recorded a record trade surplus uh, because our businesses have responded uh, to the new opportunities available to them. Now, with all business engagements come certain degrees of risks and certain degrees of unpredictable circumstances, and obviously the coronavirus at present has impacted upon many different business sectors and will continue to do so for an unknown period of time. Uh, and those businesses we have been working to try to help access new market opportunities in a range of different ways, as I indicated to Senator Hanson uh, last week in uh, terms of the seafood sector. Uh, we have provided dedicated Austrade uh, contact reference point for that sector to give them access not just to one different market but to advice about any different markets that we have uh, trade representation in and the ability to be able to service in those markets. In terms of the uh, Indonesia-Australia Con Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, it doesn't just contain uh, agreements uh, across a range of categories to uh, lower tariffs or, uh, uh, or increase quotas or indeed uh, eliminate in some cases tariffs or quotas. Uh, it also does contain guarantees around the issuing of import permits uh, to make bureaucratic procedures easier. Uh, I cannot, Senator Roberts, off the top of my head recall the place of table grapes in relation to that. Uh, so if I have particular information in relation to table grapes uh, that can be of assistance, I'll make sure that that is provided to you and the chamber. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me be more speci specific then. In their submission to the inquiry into the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the Department of Agriculture of your government stated that trade with Indonesia is unpredictable, suffering unexpected changes to import regulations and policies. The government needs to establish and nurture government-to-government -government links that support access for Australian exports. Why is the government ignoring the advice of its own agriculture department? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I'd invite Senator Roberts to read the rest of the submission, which was, of course, actually arguing for the type of agreement that we have secured with Indonesia uh, to overcome the type of problems that you have quoted, Senator Roberts. So, yes, uh, the Department of Agriculture absolutely identified that there have been market access barriers, uh, and those access barriers are not just tariffs and quotas, but they are regulatory factors as well. Uh, and the type of agreement we have sought to strike with Indonesia is one that addresses those regulatory barriers. Not only, not only do we have the automatic issuance of import permits guarantee in a range of categories that I referenced before, uh, but as a first for our trade agreements, we have with Indonesia uh, established under IHEPA uh, an arrangement for ongoing dialogue in relation to non-tariff barriers. So those types of administrative and bureaucratic licensing approval type processes uh, are now firmly entrenched in an ongoing process, and if there is something in relation to table grapes, well, as I said, we'll certainly be taking Order. it up with them Senator using Birmingham. those procedures. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Department's submission to the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership inquiry was in 2017. Growers have contacted my office this week to say that nothing has changed. They still cannot get Indonesian licences to export. What has this government done since 2017 to implement the recommendation of your own agriculture department? Senator Birmingham. Uh, negotiated, concluded and legislated for a free trade agreement with Indonesia, Senator Roberts. That is, uh, that is precisely what we've done since 2017. Uh, in doing so, uh, we have, as I've just outlined, put in place processes around getting import permits, processes around dealing with licensing and approvals. Uh, I can inform the Senate uh, that table grapes uh, enter Indonesia duty-free as a result of trade agreements negotiated between Australia and Indonesia, uh, that, uh, that Indonesia has uh, consistently been in, uh, in a top two destination uh, for many years except 2014 in relation to table grapes. So there are access points into Indonesia for table grapes. 
uh, but certainly if some growers are facing difficulty in getting those licence approvals for duty-free access of their table grapes into Indonesia, then please put them in touch with our office and we will do our best uh, through our DFAT and Austrade offices uh, to help them to get uh, the permits and approvals that they need. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the novel coronavirus and what the Australian government is doing to protect Australians? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Soka for the question. Uh, globally, we know that the coronavirus continues to expand. Uh, as at the 10th of February 2020, approximately 40,000 546 confirmed cases there have been, and 910 deaths have been reported. The majority of cases have been reported from mainland China, with 375 cases reported from 27 countries and regions outside of mainland China. Of the 910 confirmed deaths, 908 have been from mainland China and one each from the Philippines and Hong Kong. Of the confirmed cases reported globally, the case fatality rate is approximately 2 per cent. In Australia, we are in a position where, as at 10 February 2020, there are 15 confirmed cases of coronavirus in Australia, two in South Australia, five in Queensland, four in Victoria and four in New South Wales. Of the reported cases, five of the earlier cases have recovered, with the remaining cases understood to be in stable condition. The second Qantas flight to assist the departure of Australians from Wuhan has arrived home. The Qantas flight arrived in Darwin at approximately 11.51 local time, and passengers are now at the temporary quarantine facility at Howard Springs. The activation of this facility is part of our detailed contingency planning to support overflow from the primary quarantine facility on Christmas Island. 266 passengers are now at the facility, including six Australian government personnel and eight Pacific Island country nationals. Uh, all passengers have undertaken five health screenings. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on the safety of the quarantine facilities at Howard Springs? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. With the primary quarantine facility on Christmas Island now at capacity from a public health and quarantine perspective, the government has selected the Howard Springs accommodation facility because it is well equipped for public health and quarantine purposes. I am advised the chief medical officer and the minister for health visited the temporary quarantine facility Howard Springs on Friday and report that there is no threat to the community from people being housed at the Howard Springs facility. The government chief medical officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, said people staying at the Howard Springs accommodation facility were unlikely to become infectious and their health would be closely monitored, stating, it is important people living in and around Howard Springs know the novel coronavirus can only be transmitted by close contact with an infectious person and cannot be spread through the air. The Chief Medical Officer has also said he is confident the security and public health measures put in place will prevent any risk to the community's health. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Minister, what further steps has the Australian government taken to keep Australians safe in the face of the novel coronavirus. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. The Australian government has assisted over 530 Australians to safely return to Australia on two Qantas flights and the New Zealand flight. All repatriated Australians and their families are being well looked after, either on the primary facility at Christmas Island or at the temporary facility at Howard Springs. They are being provided all necessary health care throughout their stay by a highly skilled and well-equipped Australian medical assistance team. There have been no confirmed cases of coronavirus amongst these people. The Australian people should be reassured that we are taking all necessary measures to contain this virus and protect Australians. We are continuing to enact enhanced border measures, and the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee is continuing to meet daily to provide expert medical advice to government. 
We are prepared, we are acting, and we will continue to follow the expert medical advice. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Last week, Senator Reynolds told the Senate that, according to experts, the government had done all it could to provide the aerial firefighting capability required to protect Australians. Does the minister stand by that claim? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Yes, I do. Senator Watt. In December 2017, the National Aerial Firefighting Centre provided a business case to the federal government requesting a permanent increase in funding of $11 million to its annual budget. On 4 January this year, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons said, and I quote, we haven't seen a positive response to that business case. Is failing to provide a positive response to the business case for two years an example of the government doing all it could? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I absolutely stand by my comments in the Senate last week. Uh, we have worked incredibly close with NAFIC and with the states and territories. We have provided significant support to NAFIC. And in fact, the states recently asked for one additional large uh, aerial tanker, and we provided four. We have, taken, we have taken the advice of the experts, and we have provided all possible assistance. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. More than 3,000 Australian families have lost their homes during the bushfire crisis. Can the minister explain to these families why the government failed to heed the advice of fire commissioners and NAFSI to provide a permanent boost to Australia's aerial firefighting capability? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Watt, that question is beneath you, and it is absolutely disgra it is utterly disgraceful that you are linking the lives of people to the support this federal government, defence, and EMA order. have provided. So Senator Reynolds, um, Senator Wong, now Senator Wong, on the point of order. Point of order direct relevance. What perhaps this minister should be ashamed of is telling the Senate one thing which is clearly not true. NAFIC's advice order. was not received. Why don't you answer Senator that question Wong. instead of Senator this feigned Wong. outrage? Is, Senator Wong, that's not a point of order. Senator Cormann on the point of order? Uh, uh, Senator Wong should withdraw that imputation on a senator. Um, I didn't hear one. I'll check the hand side. There, was in, there were interjections going on. I'll check the hand side. I, I did not hear any, refer, any, any, any comment, but I'll take Senator Wong. You, no, if you're not asking a bit. I, I didn't hear what could be withdrawn, so I, I will check the hand side. And, um, on, the, on the issue of the point of order, on the issue of the point of order, it's a, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, interjections are disorderly, and the and the uh, Senator Wong Order. is interjecting while you Senator are addressing Coleman? the chamber. That is highly disorderly. I have made the observation before that it is regularly put to me that question time is primarily a forum for the opposition. We are wasting that time if there continue to be interjections. Now, there is a time for debating answers, contents and the merits of them after question time. It is not by interjection during question time. Senator Reynolds, in my view, is being directly relevant to the question. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll just reiterate my complete rejection of every single word Senator Watt said. Then it is a complete and utter disgrace that you are linking that you are linking the work that Australian officials, the EMA, and this government has done, working order very closely on my left. Can I and order? providing the Sorry, support Senator Reynolds, that the experts please resume have recommended. Seat. Senator Reynolds, again, can people at least count to ten after I call for silence so we get a little bit of it? I, the minister had barely commenced speaking before the interjection started again. It's a poor reflection on the Senate. Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, Senator Watt, these are the facts that you so conveniently ignore. That in 2019-20, the government funded NAFIC to $45 million. We provided Senator 14, Watt. nearly $15 million under Senator long-standing Watt. funding Count agreement. To 10 and $20 million again for additional firefighting aircraft. And again, I say to you, Senator Watt, shame on you. Shame on you all for politicising. It is your disgrace. Order. Order. I don't think it is a... I, I, 
Ora. I'll, I'll simply. The clock will run down until I'm going to call the next senator for a question. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can Order, the Minister Senator what? Can the Minister update the Senate on how Australia is providing assistance? Order. To Sorry, Senator Bragg. Please resume your seat. Please. I can't hear the question. I just want to be able to hear the question. I really don't think we want to get into seating arrangements during question time. Um, Senator Bragg, please commence your question again because I couldn't hear it. Thank you. I, I can't hear you. I can't, I can't hear you. Too please far away. Commence the question again, Senator Bragg. My, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on how Australia is providing assistance to Australians affected by the Contra, sorry, the coronavirus outbreak. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg uh, for his question. Uh, yesterday, of course, 266 passengers uh, who took the second assisted departure flight from Wuhan arrived uh, in Australia. Those passengers continue to show no signs of being infected by the coronavirus, and the Australians on the first flight and those who were assisted by New Zealand uh, also remain healthy on the advice of the chief medical officers. Uh, the passengers on the flight yesterday included 95 children under 16 years of age, 11 of whom were infants, and 16 passengers over 60 years of age. And again, we have focused on helping those Australians in an isolated and vulnerable position, and we have prioritised keeping family units together. This brings the total number of Australians who have been assisted to leave Wuhan to 531. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Crisis Centre has taken over 10,000 calls since the 23rd of January. Our, embassies and our, our embassy and our consulates in China have received more than 2,000 calls for advice or assistance. We are, of course, also aware of a number of Australian children who do remain in Wuhan with family, but who have no immediate guardian to accompany them on any assisted departure flight. We have uh, explored options to assist uh, these children to come home, but Chinese authorities have not agreed to allow family members who are Chinese nationals without Australian citizenship or permanent residence to board these flights. That does, uh, in effect, restrict those options, Mr President. And we do understand that this is a difficult situation. The children remain with family, um, advised in most cases with grandparents, uh, and being well cared for. We are well aware of the challenges that this presents, and we will continue to talk with Australians uh, as this matter proceeds. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Can the minister provide an update on what the Australian government is doing to help Australians beyond Wuhan and Hubei province? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, a number of Australians uh, are in other parts of China beyond Hubei province, as well as on cruise ships, as senators would be aware. The government is in contact with many of them. Australian officials are closely monitoring medical and welfare services on board the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which has been quarantined in Japan and is carrying 218 Australians. And when necessary, we are referring Australian cases to cruise company officials or the Japanese government as appropriate for action. DFAT is providing consular assistance to the seven Australians who were diagnosed with the virus on the Diamond Princess and are now in hospitals in Japan. Our officials have also relayed offers of, consular, offers of consular assistance through the operator of the Westerdam cruise ship, on which there are 49 Australians. Uh, to date, there are no known cases of coronavirus on board that ship. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain how Australia has coordinated with our neighbours to help citizens of the Pacific Island communities? Senator, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. We are working closely with our Pacific Island neighbours, with New Zealand and with the WHO, to protect our region from coronavirus through a number of measures that include a regional response plan, the provision of personal protective equipment and the deployment of Australian health experts to the region. An Australian DFAT official has joined the WHO hub in Suva to assist with addressing the coronavirus issues in our region. We are also working with regional governments on issues related to the movement of shipping and the coronavirus in the region. 
I was very pleased, Mr. President, that uh, we were also able to help uh, members of our Pacific family by including eight vulnerable students from the Pacific Islands on the second assisted departure flight from Wuhan, which arrived yesterday, uh, as New Zealand did on their flight last week. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. I refer to an answer to questions on notice returned 18 December 2019 regarding the $150 million female facilities program, which asked, which minister currently has the authority to approve projects for funding from this pool? The answer returned by the Department of Health stated, Minister Colbeck, in consultation with the Prime Minister. What, what consultation has occurred between the minister and the Prime Minister or your officers regarding this $150 million election slush fund? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, the, the answer that uh, is provided to that question on notice is absolutely correct. Any further allocations that come out of that program uh, will be uh, done uh, as a matter of consultation between myself uh, and the Prime Minister. At this point in time, Mr President, uh, the only funding allocated is that, is that that was publicly released uh, to the media on Friday. Uh, my department is effectively managing the administration of the grants that were made under the program to date. Uh, there, has been, um, uh, there is no further allocation or granting or approval of projects at this point in time. Uh, the, the process is in the phase of management of existing grants. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Further answers to questions on notice reveal that the authority to grant approvals under this program transferred to the minister in August 2019. How many projects were approved prior to the Minister for Sport receiving this authority? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I said in uh, question earlier in question time, and as uh, uh, the, the projects that are being funded through this program were election commitments. The government made election commitments in the lead-up to the election, uh, just in, in exactly the same way that the opposition did. In fact, uh, the opposition promised uh, many of the same projects. Many of the same order. projects. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Um, uh, direct relevance. Would you like me to repeat the question, Mr. President? Um, uh, it was, a, it was a quantitative question. Quite right. That's a good way to describe it. I am listening very carefully to the minister's answer. In, in answer, being directly relevant, my view is that he is entitled to talk about grants made and timing. Um, I don't view discussion of alternative policies to be directly relevant to such a specific question. Senator Cormann, I take just, just submission on the, the point on, of on order. The, on, on the point of order, just to point out how the minister was being directly relevant. He was asked indeed about the projects that had been approved, and the minister clearly spelled out that the projects under this uh, program were those that were publicly announced uh, prior to the election as election commitments. And, and uh, that's exactly where I was going, on the basis that I, in being asked about a number I consider to be asking the chair to instruct the minister how to answer the question. He is being directly relevant as long as the answer pertains to what I believe he was talking about at the point, which was the grants that were made prior to the time stated in the question. The Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, all of the projects that are being funded to this point, under, uh, all of the projects, all of the projects that are being funded under this program. Uh, were the subject of uh, election commitments, and uh, Senator Wong is right in her chatter across the chamber. Uh, there were, Mr. President, there were 41 projects allocated funding uh, through election commitments that are now being administered under this program. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Has the minister, at any point under this program, approved grants in his home state of Tasmania? <laughs> Senator Colbeck. Yes, Mr. President, um, Mr. President uh, this program is administering the delivery of, pro of grants uh, of election commitments that were made during the, the uh, election campaign before I became minister. Uh, the role that uh, my department has at this point in time is to administer the election commitments that were made uh, by the government in the lead-up to the election. Senator McMahon. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on how Defence is supporting our Australian Defence Force members transition from permanent military service to civilian life? 
The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator McMahon for her question, but also for her deep commitment to the ADF personnel who are stationed in the Northern Territory. Thank you. Uh, I'm extremely proud that this government is showing the same commitment and duty to our ADF members, our veterans, and also their families as they themselves have shown to this nation. As highlighted in the recently announced suicide prevention measures, the issues we face, and I know that we face them together on a bipartisan basis, are numerous and they are complex. For example, transitioning from military service to civilian life can be, for many, a very challenging life event, and it does provide a period of uncertainty for many members and for their families. Since 2017, Defence has put smart thinking and targeted resources behind its transition transformation program, and we believe that continual improvement is the key. As the Minister, I am committed to ensuring that Defence works closely with the Department of Veterans Affairs to help our ADF members and their families in very practical and very positive ways to transition successfully from their service life to the next chapter of their lives in both their careers and also their family lives. Defence has a suite of enhanced transition programs designed to prepare ADF members and their families to take responsibility for their own lives, welfare and development, which includes their health and their well-being, social engagement, employment and education, and also accommodation and finances. We are also committed to ensuring members have access to the right support at the right time, especially those who are vulnerable or at risk. And importantly, I think that members are assessed individually and treated according to their own personal needs, whether it's in mental health care, patient care, or also occupational rehabilitation. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Can the minister update the Senate on how Defence is working with Veterans Affairs? to ensure young, at-risk veterans get the support they need as they transition out of service. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you again, Senator McMahon, for the question. Yes, I can confirm that Defence and DVA are working closely together, and in fact I believe they have, most closely they have ever worked together, to provide at-risk transitioning veterans with a single point of contact to ensure their seamless support is ongoing. Uh, access to the appropriate health treatment and also to help them finalise their own claims. Last week, the government announced a significant funding boost to this coordinated program, an, additional, uh, an addition of 170 veterans, in particularly those from the most vulnerable uh, age group, which is 17 to 30, the cohorts, and they will be supported as they transition into a civilian career. This means that 10 additional case coordinators will be backed by nearly $5 million investment in a program that is already helping over 1,200 veterans facing challenging circumstances. And a further investment of $5.6 million will assist another 1,600 ADF members. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline to the Senate the significance to Australian Defence Force members, veterans, their families and the nation of ensuring successful transition from service to civilian life and employment. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again, Senator McMahon. Uh, you are right. It is absolutely critical that we get this component correct. All of us here in this chamber and the government and all Australians owe it to the men and women who have served our nation and also their families to give them the support that they have given us through their service and also their sacrifice as a family. As Australians, we demand the highest standards of our ADF men and women, and we have a responsibility to support them in all aspects of their professional and personal development, health and wellbeing, from the first day of their service through to their return through their civilian lives and their lives with their families. Transition planning should and is now starting from their enlistment to start thinking about and preparing for the time that they transition back to a civilian life. And this is why the government is so focused on ensuring that they have a successful transition 
and a long and happy life with their families. Yeah. And in Order, Senator point. Reynolds. Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> I ask that further questions be placed on an older space. Before I come to you, Senator Watt, can I just deal with one brief housekeeping matter? As senators are aware, the temporary order agreed to last year means that no divisions can take place between 6.30 and 7.30 tonight. I understand that it suits the convenience of the Senate for the discussion on the matter of public importance from Senator Seawitt to be held between tonight between 6.30 and 7.30, and this has been discussed between whips and managers. So with the concurrence of the Senate, it is so ordered. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. It's come to my attention that in answering my question, Senator Reynolds asserted that I was linking the loss of lives of Australians to government policies and decisions. That is completely incorrect and I did no such thing. I'd ask that you review the Hansard and, uh, if I am correct in saying this, ask that the minister withdraw those I, remarks. I will review the Hansard. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to uh, take note of the answer given uh, by Senator Colbeck to the question that I, uh, I asked him. Um, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse for the government under the uh, sports uh, rorts uh, scandal uh, <clears throat> over the first uh, three weeks of this uh, year, of course, we found out uh, last uh, Friday uh, about uh, sports rorts too. Um, Senator McKenzie, of course, when she uh, first was confronted with uh, the evidence in relation to sports rorts one, uh, said it was ridiculous that she should uh, be asked to uh, resign. Of course, she did resign, and uh, we thought that might have been the, uh, the end of it, that uh, the $100 million uh, that was uh, spent on uh, <coughs> Sports Rorts 1 uh, was, the, uh, was the end of the matter. But, of course, on Friday we discovered that we've got Sports Rorts 2. Um, <coughs> and it wasn't just $100 million, Mr Acting Deputy President. It was uh, $150 million uh, to Sports Rorts uh, program. Um, <coughs> and combined uh, between them, those two uh, those two sports rorts projects uh, rep represent almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of uh, taxpayers' uh, money. Now, of course, the Prime Minister, when confronted um, about sports rorts uh, on Friday, of course, uh, w was so confused uh, and um, one suspects embarrassed that. Uh, we hadn't just been dealing with sports rorts one, but we now had sports rorts two. That he answered the question in respect of sports rorts one, and of course he he goes back to his his um, his notes, his uh, concept uh, of what his response should be to this, and of course that's uh, that it's all about women's change rooms, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and how the government has been supporting uh, women's change rooms. So. We had a look at Sports Rorts 2, the $150 million, uh, which the Prime Minister and the then Sports Minister, Senator McKenzie, uh, said was all about giving women um, change rooms and improving their facilities. Terrific aim, supported by the, uh, the opposition, the Labor Party. Uh, but what do we find out about uh, this $150 million? Well, what we find out, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, is only a fraction, only a fraction of the amount of money that was supposed to go to women's uh, facilities, improving their facilities at sporting grounds around the country, actually went to them. Only a fraction of it. I can see you're quite distressed there, uh, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, you, of course, would know, coming from South Australia, just how desperate. <coughs> um, a lot of these uh, sporting clubs were for that money. In fact, you can probably recall uh, when the um, government changed a couple of years ago in South Australia that the Liberals ax actually axed, axed all of the money, all of the money that the uh, previous Labor Party had set aside for improving uh, women's uh, uh, sporting facilities. Of course, <clears throat> you'd also know that um, in South Australia, um, in the three years of women's football. Um, the Adelaide Crows have in fact won 
here, here, it says Senator Birmingham, the Adelaide Crows have won two premierships, and of course that's encouraged all these young women, uh, all these young women, to start getting involved in sports. Uh, and of course, when the Prime Minister's announcement came along, $150 million to improve their facilities so they didn't have to change behind the, the uh, sporting sheds. Of course, <clears throat> they thought all their Christmases had come at once. But what happened, Mr Acting Deputy President? That money didn't go to those people. What the, what the government said it was going to go to, um, it didn't go to. Well, where did it go to? $150 million, a lot of money, combined, of course, almost a quarter of a billion dollars. Where did it go to? Well, it almost overwhelmingly went to swimming pools. Nothing wrong with swimming pools, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with swimming pools. Uh, but it went to two swimming pools in two marginal seats which the government was trying to hang on to at the last election. Now, how deceitful is that? You tell the Australian community they're big on women's sports, increased participation. Yes, we're serious about looking after you. We're serious about uh, stopping you having to change behind the, uh, uh, the uh, change rooms out the back. What do they do? They don't spend it on women's change rooms. They give it to two Thank you, swimming Senator pools. Senator Farrell, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. And I uh, uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, Senator Farrell's uh, kind words there in relation to the Adelaide Crows, which of course is one subject that we can agree on. Uh, his passion for that club shares uh, my own. One thing we can't agree on, though, however, is the, uh, is the use of this term sports rorts. Um, the, uh, uh, those across the chamber uh, will consistently use this term uh, like it has some sort of currency or like it's the repeat of a, of a bad Hollywood sequel. Um, but on this side of the chamber, we know, we know, Mr Acting Deputy President, that that is nothing but fabrication. The government has acknowledged the recommendations of the ANAO performance audit into the Community Sport Infrastructure Grant Program and is taking action with uh, Sport Australia to address the findings. Um, and where it is the case that deficiencies uh, have been identified uh, in, uh, across the board in transparency and documentation, uh, then, quite simply, Mr Acting Deputy President, they will be remedied. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is trite to suggest that this is uh, 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 something that the government should uh, hang its head. Quite the opposite. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, uh, the federal government delivered 684 projects investing in the order of $100 million into the Community Sport Infrastructure Grant Program. And we've seen firsthand the positive impacts that this program has delivered for many grassroots sporting organisations and local communities, and indeed Senator Farrell has noted a few of them. Uh, uh, the cause of women's sport uh, in, in South Australia has, of course, been in my home state, has been a very, and your home state, Mr Acting Deputy President, a, uh, a very, very uh, fine win for the community. Um, now, <clears throat> once again, to take issue with this concept of sports rorts as it's being characterised, the advice of the Attorney General in consult, consultation with the Australian government solicitor was that he didn't agree with the Auditor General's specific comments regarding ministerial authority and publicly released guidelines clearly state that the minister was the final decision maker and could take into account other issues. Uh, it's more than reasonable in circumstances that the minister has the final decision maker and has some discretion because um, it is clear, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that that is the role of the minister. The minister's job uh, is to make decisions, and uh, uh, that is what he or she will do in the circumstances. And that's why this government ultimately is acting on recommendation four from the ANAO, uh, so that uh, where ministers have discretion to make decisions and where they may move away from whatever reason from those recommendations might be, that there's a process of accountability and transparency. And we should also um, take this opportunity uh, to, to make the point that um, it, this is not, and it, one only has to cast one's mind back a relatively short amount of time. And uh, you know, I hear the calls of uh, sports rorts and that sort of thing from the other side of the chamber. But of course, um, the ANO, ANAO made it very clear that the way the program was conducted delivered on its intent, and that is the critical factor to be brought into account here. Uh, all of the projects that the government backed were eligible, and they were eligible 
uh, for support, unlike, for example, Labor's Catherine King, who the Auditor General found was spending taxpayer money on projects against the recommendations of experts. Or, let's say, Ros Kelly, who funded ineligible projects. So we are talking about quite separate and distinct concepts here. And as the PM has said, the Prime Minister has said, uh, the Secretary of the, uh, found that the Minister actually uh, did not take into account political factors as a primary consideration when making her decisions. So these are crucial distinctions, Mr Acting Deputy President. They are, they are not merely trivial matters. They are quite significant. We are dealing with uh, decisions that have been made which have had positive impacts in the community. We're now seeing um, these uh, funding arrangements rolled out such that there are now change rooms for uh, community clubs and so forth. And in fact, uh, it's true to say that electorates held by our friends across the chamber there, the Australian Labor Party, represented as many as 35 per cent of approved projects uh, and 34 per cent of approved funding. Um, these electorates would, of course, have been less successful had Sport Australia's assessment team uh, of recommendations been maintained. So there are many Labor uh, front benches who have welcomed these and, of course, none more significant than the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, who actually went so far as to uh, thank Minister Mackenzie for her support for the Dawn Fraser pool in his electorate. Quite a, quite a suggestion. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I, I rise to speak on this important issue again, because again it was the focus of question time from the Labor opposition today. And I'd say to those government senators who they've sent him here to defend uh, the sports rorts, uh, that they put themselves—and I said this last week as well—put uh, yourselves in the shoes of those uh, mums and dads and other volunteers who are the lifeblood of these community groups, who are actually responsible for putting in these submissions, that received a high score and yet the government completely disregarded them for their own political purposes. So they're the people they need to be thinking about when they come in here and defend this as to say, oh, well, this is just what the government did and we made these decisions. Uh, who they are dudding are those mums and dads and other volunteers out there who put in the hours that they don't have. They're giving up other things while they are putting in those hours to put in these submissions so the government can, can ignore them. And they ignored them through three processes through the first sports rort. So there was, there was round one, there was round two and round three. And what do we know from those rounds is that as each one went further, uh, they completely disregarded the Sports Australia uh, recommendations uh, up to 73 per cent it was by the last round. So the closer the election got, the more likely they were to disregard the Sports Australia recommendation. But that wasn't enough for them. The three rounds, uh, the $100 million wasn't enough. Uh, they come up with another plan for $150 million for them to spend during the election campaign. So all up, they spent a quarter of a billion dollars uh, through this process to help in their re-election campaign. And if that's what they want to come in and defend, then I'm happy to take the fight up to them every day of the week. And what is outrageous is the performance of the Prime Minister, uh, and particularly when it comes to sports rorts too, because this is the quote from the Prime Minister when he launched this fund. The principal objective of that is to ensure that there are changing facilities and other facilities to support more girls and women's participation in sport all around the country. Uh, that is what the Prime Minister said when he launched this fund. Well, guess how much of the, the $150 million was spent on female change rooms? Less than 15 per cent. So for him to actually try and justify that on the support that everyone in this place and around the country has for female sport and to get more women involved in sport is absolutely nonsense. Uh, and he should be held accountable for that because he tries to go, and he's still using it today to try and justify this, this sports frauds, on the fact that it was for female change rooms, when the reality is just 15 per cent went on female facilities. But what we do know is $60 million, or 40 per cent, went on funding pools uh, in two Liberal held seats of Corangamite and Pearce. So this actually goes to show the motivation of this government. Uh, they say one thing when they try and justify it, but the reality of this program is it was to buy votes and win marginal seats and try and form government again. And that's the sole purpose. So we saw that with Sports Rorts 1. Uh, increasingly, as we got closer to the election, uh, they were disregarding Sports Australia and trying to fund their projects in marginal seats. And then they weren't done with that when that finished in April. They come up with another $150 million 
that was to go to uh, their funding that they could use to fund projects that they wanted. Uh, and it goes to also the substance of uh, the decisions that they made around who was responsible for it. So uh, when the uh, policy was released, there was a document prepared by Infrastructure Australia, uh, Infrastructure Department, which said that guidelines for the program were meant to be delivered in June last year. But guidelines have never been released for this funding program, and already the $150 million allocation has been exhausted. So they, even when they released and announced the money, and we heard uh, the rot from the Prime Minister about uh, what the basis of it was, that is dismissed uh, because that is not what they have done. But they said when they launched the fund that there would be guidelines that would be issued. But we now know that the fund has been completely uh, spent and there's no uh, guidelines uh, that have been issued at all. Uh, the Health Department stated that the program was not open to applications and all proponents were selected by government. Uh, so there were no uh, published guidelines, uh, there was no criteria for the allocation of funding uh, and all announcements were made by the, by, uh, the government at the time, uh, including the minister. So we know that the Department of Health and Senator Colbeck had responsibility for the program in consultation with the Prime Minister, but I think they have so many uh, sports sports programs that they are funding that the minister himself got confused about which one he was talking about uh, in terms of the question from Senator Farrell uh, in regards to the guidelines that they were using. So uh, they are desperately trying to keep their head above water on this, but we know there is so much more coming Thank their you, way Senator to Chisholm. take accountability for. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, the hide of the Labor Party, the pink hide of the Labor Party to lecture anyone on so-called sports rorts. And for you, Senator Chisholm, I haven't been sent here at all. In fact, I'm more than happy to be here today. Because those opposite didn't just put the pork in the barrel, they rang the piggery. Snouts in the trough all the way back to Goff. In fact, even they have forgotten their own patron saint. Who could ever forget? Saint Ros Kelly and her whiteboard. Only barefaced hypocrites would fail to recall the events of late 1993 when Sports Minister Kelly failed to explain the distribution of grants to marginal seats in the Labor-Keating government. So every time you want to attack the Prime Minister, just have a good think about your insult to the memory of your beloved Keating. Paul would be appalled. Your amnesia couldn't be any more convenient or selective. Of course, when Ros Kelly resigned, it was a disaster for Labor. They even lost the traditionally safe Labor seat of Canberra. Maybe they should have been installing the lights at Manuka Oval way back then. And guess what? It was the Auditor General complaining about the manner in which the department had administered $30 million in grants under the Community Cultural, Recreational and Sporting Facilities Program. But it was a program started by guess who? Yes, there's no party without punch. It was the godfather, Graham Richardson of the Labor right. Mr. Whatever It Takes, the Prince of the Piggery, cooking up this program on a spit in 1988. It was Richo's very own bicentenary gift to the nation, a rort in which Labor could shore up endangered seats. In fact, only recently Richo told Paul Murray on Sky News, and I quote, I did exactly the same thing, only better. And I got into no trouble whatsoever. I skated through as I used to do on everything. And then he joked that Ros Kelly wasn't so lucky. He was laughing out loud. Now there's a sick sense of humour. But as a Senator of New South Wales, the fact that any Labor member from my state should suggest impropriety in this dog whistling smear of a way is astounding. In fact, if it wasn't so offensive, it'd be hilarious. The party that boosts the Audi brand better than any advertising campaign who appears before ICAC so regularly it's almost part of their brand, who must attend caucus meetings so inconveniently and uncomfortably when the poor member for Kingsford Smith has to acknowledge that he wasn't so keen on the elevation of now Senator Keneally for the, for the premiership. But luckily for Senator Keneally, the, the Frank Sartor supporters in Mr, in Mr Thistlewaite had Eddie O'B to make calls on her behalf. So I'd suggest to those opposite they at least try to keep a straight face when you gaze into that mirror and look at yourself with those shifty eyes. But on a more positive note, I would like to acknowledge the success 
of the former Minister for Agriculture, who has now stepped aside from the ministry, and that we look at the loss that she is to the Cabinet and to the ministry and the contribution that she made to Australia and the successful programs that she did introduce and the wonderful acknowledgement and the wonderful contribution she made to this country, even just at the end of last year, de delivering a mandatory dairy code of conduct. The fact that she injected $3.5 million to the Farm Safety Education Fund to improve on-farm safety, something that we should always be looking at when we look at the number of accidents that cause unnecessary deaths on farms. The fact that she put $3.9 million towards Beef Australia, promoting our Australian beef in international markets, something that we should be looking at today when we look at our Indonesian trade deal. She was very much a part of opening up agricultural trade and market access cooperation programs worth $6.8 million helping farmers access new and profitable markets. She passed the farm trespass laws to make it unlawful to incite others to invade farms and harass farming families, something too many people opposite in this place were too slow off the mark to condemn. She established a national feral pig coordinator to tackle Australia's feral pig population. She put $5 million towards the Kids to Farm program, part of the government's $10 million educating kids about agriculture. A significant part of these programs were great contributions to this nation, and I'm sure, given time, Senator McKenzie will once again be able to make a great contribution to our country. It now being four o'clock, we do have a hard marker, so the question is that the motion moved by Senator Farrell to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, those against say no. I think the eyes have it.